Welcome to Strength of Materials N5. Today's presentation is on thin cylinders and Moore's circle. First, let us look at the stresses that you have in a thin cylinder. When you're dealing with a thin cylinder, what are the stresses that you will find? And first of all, what is a thin cylinder? Well, a thin cylinder is a cylinder that's got an internal diameter that is at least 20 times greater than the thickness of the outer wall of the cylinder. When you have a cylinder that meets that condition, we refer to that cylinder as a thin cylinder. Okay, So basically, the internal diameter of the cylinder must be greater than 20 times the thickness of the outer wall of the cylinder. When that condition is met, then you are dealing with a thin cylinder. And so let us look at this picture that we have on the screen. And so let's say this is a geyser. Okay, let's say this is a geyser and inside of it you have hot water. And that hot water, because of the steam and everything, is beginning to build pressure inside of the geyser. So what you do not want to see happening, you do not want to have that geyser bursting, okay? You want it to remain intact, you want it to remain uh, fully functional. And so for that reason, then you want your cylinder or your geyser in this case to be able to withstand all the stresses that will arise because of the pressure that is inside of the geyser, okay? And so, uh, what is really important for you to understand here is that if pressure is rising inside of this geyser, okay, it is fully closed, it is not open, the water is inside and the pressure is building up. And if pressure is building up inside of this geyser, of course, the stresses are going to arise on the cylinder, okay? And the place where you will record the highest stresses will be where you have joints because it is the joints that are keeping the geyser as one okay and so when there is pressure it is these joints that are taking that the stresses that are arising due to the pressure and so uh, for the sake of this module there are two types of joints that we're going to study and the first one is what we refer to as the longitudinal joint Okay, because it is along uh, the longitudinal line here, as you can see here, this line here is a joint, okay? Uh, you can imagine that maybe uh, this geyser was welded here, okay, when it was being built. So to join it in one piece, they, wel they welded it along that line, okay? And this is a longitudinal line, and so therefore this joint here is a longitudinal joint. And then it was also welded around like this, okay, so that they could make it into one unit. And so uh, the joints along this line will be referred to as the circumferential joints, okay. They can be many if they used, uh, you know, many, maybe many rivets to join it. Uh, but if they welded it, then you can just look at it as one joint. But that's not really important. What, we, what I want you to understand is that the stresses uh, will arise where the joints are. That is where you will have the highest stresses. Because if ever this geyser was to burst, it will burst and break at the joints. Okay, so you have two types of joints. First, the longitudinal joint and then you also have the circumferential joints okay so these are the two types of joints that you have and as you can see in the picture on the longitudinal joint the type of stress that you have is the circumferential stress okay but on the circumferential joint the type of stress that you have is the longitudinal stress so do not get confused about this, okay? I repeat, on the longitudinal joint, the type of stress that you have is the circumferential stress. On the circumferential joint, the type of stress that you have, as you can see, the direction of it is the longitudinal 
stress, okay? That's the stress you have on the circumferential joints. The stress you have on the longitudinal joints is the circumferential stress. You can see the directions, okay? This is the longitudinal direction. It's the same direction as that line. However, if you look at it, you will see that this stress will occur on the circumferential joints. And then on the longitudinal joints, the stress that occurs there is the circumferential stress, okay? I hope that is very clear to understand. And so now I am going to give you equations that relate to these uh, stresses. And so first, let us begin with the longitudinal stress on circumferential joints, okay? So that is the equation that we will uh, end up getting. But before we get there, we need to know the longitudinal force that is acting on circumferential joints, okay? And so that force, sometimes they may just refer to it as the force acting on circumferential joints, okay? I have seen many times in uh, exam questions, they will ask you to calculate the force acting on circumferential joint. They will not say the whole thing, the longitudinal force acting on circumferential joint. They might not say it like that. They may just say the force acting on circumferential joint. It's the same thing, okay? And the equation for it is that. And then after you also have the resistance force for circumferential joints, okay? Because you have a force that is acting on the joints, but you also have a resistance force for circumferential joints. And that force is given by this equation here. Okay, and what you see here, sigma L, is the longitudinal stress. And so if we want to find an equation for the longitudinal stress, then the equation for the longitudinal stress is this one. Okay, so we basically make this equal to that, and then we account for the efficiency of the circumferential joint. Okay, in some of the questions, they may not give this to you, but in other questions, they will give it to you, so you will need to plug it in this equation. But if it's not given, then this value is 1, okay? Very important. No efficiency, then put 1 here. Right. Then, let us look now at the circumferential stress on longitudinal joints, okay? And here, the first, first of all, we need to look at the circumferential force acting on longitudinal joints. Okay, and sometimes they may just refer to this one also just as the force acting on longitudinal joints. And if that is the case, then uh, you just know that what they actually mean is the circumferential force that is acting on the longitudinal joint or joints if it's many. Okay, and so the equation for it is given by that. And then you also have the resistance force for longitudinal joints, and the equation for it is that. And then if you make this equal to that, you can then derive an expression for the circumferential stress. And of course, we will again, in this case, account for the efficiency of the longitudinal joint. Okay, very, very important. And so, if that is not given in the question, then you just make this equal to 1. Very, very important. Again, I will stress the fact that sometimes, instead of saying the longitudinal force acting on circumferential joints, they may just say the force acting on circumferential joints. And same thing here, okay? Instead of saying the circumferential force acting on longitudinal joints, they may just say the force acting on longitudinal joints, okay? They may say joints or they may just say joint. It's okay, okay? Do not get troubled by that. It's fine. And so uh, that is very important for you to know. I remember my students, uh, when we were doing an internal test at the school, uh, they asked, in the question, it was asked to find the force acting on circumferential joints, and then the next one was the force acting on longitudinal joints. And the majority of them swiped the equations, okay? They used this equation for that one, and then they used this equation for this one, okay? So you need to be very careful to not 
make that mistake, know which equation is for what. Many people get confused between circumferential and longitudinal. So you need to maybe pause the video here and make sure that you have understood and memorized these equations. Okay, very, very important. Otherwise, you're going to get mixed up between longitudinal and circumferential. And you will be using equations that will lead you to answers that do not belong to that question. But that those answers are actually right, but for another question, just because you mixed them up. So do not make that mi mistake. Just take the time to make sure that you know this very well. You understand the differences very well and you know which equations to use where. Okay. Now, let us look at the strain that you have in thin cylinders. The first one I will look at is the longitudinal strain. And the equation for it is this. Now, you can see that in the equation for the longitudinal strain, you have an expression for the longitudinal stress and also for the circumferential stress. The V that you see here is Poisson's ratio. It's usually given to you in the question. They will say V is equal maybe to 0 0.3 or something like that. So that is what you will put in here. It's called Poisson's ratio. Okay, Poisson's ratio. Very important. And so this is the equation for the longitudinal stress, but you can replace the long sorry, for the longitudinal strain. This is the equation for the longitudinal strain. And you can replace the longitudinal stress and the circumferential stress by their equations. And then this equation can end up being written like this. Okay, so if you just replace sigma L by 1,